Hi everyone, my name is Rebecca Morrison and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Colorado Boulder and today I'll tell you a little bit about my work in learning sparse dynamics, uh, specifically of interacting systems. So I've come to this problem uh, from the world of model reduction and model error. Uh, model error has a lot of names, it's also called model discrepancy, model inadequacy, also model form uncertainty, there's probably more. Um, anyway, uh, and so the idea is in complex systems, we all know that we often use reduced models or even very highly reduced models, which do not perfectly represent the real system in question. Um, and of course, many times that's fine. A uh, canonical example of this is uh, using Newtonian physics um, to describe motion of large bodies, uh, ignoring relativistic and quantum effects, uh, which you know is completely uh, a fine thing to do in a lot of situations. Um, but in some cases, you know, I'm interested in when these reductions go too far and when the model actually does become inadequate. And so for this talk, we'll say a model is inadequate when the imperfections of the model lead to a detectable inconsistency between the model and the observations that we have. Okay, so in this case, we'd of course like to improve the model, but there are a number of reasons why we might not be able to in a straightforward manner. So we might not have the time. We might know what this sort of better high fidelity model should be, but we don't have the computational resources to run it. Um, or we might actually not know what this best model actually looks like. Okay, but if we have model error uh, and we want to use this model to make predictions, then it's really critical to try to represent the error that we have um, so that you know, we come up with honest, good predictions. Okay, so how do we do that? How do we characterize the model error? Well, the goal for this talk will to be, or for this work is to represent the model error of reduced models of interacting systems. Um, and this representation will, the representation of this model error will do a few things. It will be a sparse operator embedded within the reduced model, embedded within the differential equations. It will be explicitly designed to satisfy whatever physical constraints or information we have. And it will also be calibrated from data and hopefully data from uh, many different initial conditions or scenarios. Okay, but then the challenge of doing something like this is that the representation of the model error depends on the context because this is a very intrusive approach. So we have to go in inside the model and sort of mess around with it. So of course then it depends on the context. Okay, so the context that I wanna focus on today are the generalized Lotka Volterra equations. Um, these are actually very general equations for nonlinear ordinary differential equations to describe the time dynamics of interacting species. Um, so here you see the sort of um, model form in uh, vector and matrix notation. So X will be the vector of our species concentrations. B is what's called an intrinsic growth rate vector. And A is the um, interaction matrix that describes the interactions between species. And so these equations um, are used all over the place. They show up, of course, in ecology and mathematical ecology applications. Um, there are also um, the standard form of many chemical reaction and combustion models. Uh, they also are a generalized form of many epidemiology models, such as the SIR, SEIR models that people, of course, are looking at today. Um, okay, 
But here we'll make a couple assumptions to sort of narrow the scope a bit. Um, we'll assume that the interaction matrix A is diagonally dominant, symmetric, negative, definite, and that all entries are negative. That um, in an ecological sense means that all interactions between species are competitive. Um, these are not uncommon assumptions to see on the matrix A, but um, um, yeah, so we'll, we'll start with that for now. Okay, so there's one main question, and that's given a reduced model in this framework with little s species and data from some detailed model, from some high fidelity model that we think of as our truth, how can we represent the resulting model error in a way that respects physical information about the system? Okay, so we're going to look at that. But before I start, I want to give a couple of background examples that helped motivate this work. So the first example is about this algebraic reduction or conversion of ODEs. So this is um, this example is taken from a paper by Harrington and Van Gorder in nonlinear dynamics. And um, so in this example, we start with a Lorentz system of three ODEs. And they show in this paper how this system can be algebraically converted to a single third order differential equation. So it's not the nicest looking thing, but this is an exact transformation from these three ODEs to a single ODE. But now we've introduced these higher derivatives on X. You see it actually goes up to the third derivative if you apply that DDT through. Okay. So that's the first example. Second example comes from this Mori Zwanzig type formulation. And so here's um, a, just one particular example of, um, of this um, taken from this paper by Gavon, Kupferman, and Stewart in nonlinearity. And so here we have this two variable system in X and Y, and it's reduced to a single differential equation by introducing this memory kernel. So again, we start with more variables, uh, more equations, and it again gets converted to just a single equation. But we have to introduce more information about the variable we keep. So in the previous slide, that more information was um, higher derivatives. In this example, it's this um, memory. So the time history of this variable x. OK, so we can actually do something quite similar um, in the lotka volterra case. Uh, we, can, we can start with a higher number of equations and actually reduce down um, to a fewer number or even one um, under some conditions. Um, so let's look at when we start with two equations, what, what we could do. So here's uh, x1 and x2, and the right-hand side's written out. So we take um, this first equation and rewrite it for x2. And I'm going to call this um, new thing, I'm going to call it y sub 2, or y1 sub 2. So it's a sort of a new variable that is supposed to represent x2, or it does represent x2, but it only depends on x1. So you can see everything in the middle there um, just depends on x1 and x1 dot. Okay, now we can take this new thing and substitute for x2 in the second equation. And then that's what we get, just plugging that in. Now we can integrate. Okay, and I'll call this chi 1 sub 2. So now this new thing is a variable that, or an integral that really represents x2 um, at time t. Um, but as you can see, everything in there actually only depends on x1. And now we can take this thing and plug it back into our uh, first equation and we get this final thing. So we changed from 
these two equations, these two little ODEs, to a single differential equation, only in terms of x1, but now all of its time history. Um, you can actually do a very similar process and end up with an expression just for x1 in terms of its, um, its higher derivatives without any of the memory. Um, if you're interested in this, um, get, uh, send me an email. I have some more work about this. I didn't put up a reference. Okay. Okay, so let's but think again now about um, the, this larger context that we're working in. So let's consider that we have this detailed model that's made up of big S species. So big S could be 10, 20, 100, um, whatever you want. And so this is what the detailed model looks like. So of course we have S square, big S squared interaction terms right there. And so we'll think about doing reductions down to say, for example, little s equals three species. Okay, so now I wanna think about what's the reduced model that you get if you just retain the terms that interact with x1, x2, and x3. So that will be our reduced model. This is perhaps a naive model, but there are some reasons why this makes sense. So for example, if you had a large number of species, um, say um, rabbits and foxes and um, bears and snakes and so on, <laughs> and you, there was some detailed model that exists with you know, possibly hundreds of species, but you really just want to understand you know, how the bears and foxes and rabbits interact. If you had an interaction term that you believed was true between two species, it is likely that it would show up in the detailed model and also be the same as that in the reduced model. So, um, the, so anyway, this is, we could talk more about what good reduced models should actually look like, but this is what I'm going to consider right now. But I'm just going to take the sub vector and the sub matrix of my detailed model, and that's going to be my reduced model. Okay, so what happens? So let's go back to this sort of easiest case we can think about when big S equals two and little s equals one. We have this detailed model that we saw before. So the reduced model now just has these two terms on the right-hand side. And in this case, we know that the actual exact form of the model error here is just a one, two, x2, x1, if we're just interested in the species x1. Okay, but now if you think back to like, a much larger reduction from say s equals 100 down to s equals 3 or even s equals 20 down to s equals 3 or something like that, there's potentially a high loss of information in these reductions. So hundreds of terms that you could be leaving out on the right hand side of the differential equations. Okay, we're not going to try to recover all of that information, but we're going to try to recover some of it. Okay, and so the proposed approach here is to um, taking inspiration from those other background examples we looked at is to, in a sense, replace this term involving x2 with a function of x1 and its higher derivatives or possibly its time history. Okay, I'll call this the enriched model. So we'll take the differential equation for x1, the reduced model part of it that's shown in black here, and we'll tack on uh, this embedded operator and this whole thing together we'll call the enriched model. And so to begin, I wanna start really simple just with a linear polynomial in x1 and x1 dot, that's it. Okay, so now how can we incorporate some information? Well, in this case, we have some information about our dynamics. We know that the species concentrations are non-negative, and we'll assume we know that all of our interactions are competitive, so these species reach a stable equilibrium. Um, in particular, we know that all of the terms that we're leaving out when we reduce from big S to little s, all these terms on the right-hand side are actually negative because the species 
like here, x2 and x1 are positive, but these interaction coefficients are all negative. Okay, so all of this implies constraints on the parameters uh, that we include in this enrichment process. Um, next, we'll take this embedded operator and calibrate it to the data that we have. And as I mentioned before, we'll calibrate over a large uh, uh, range of initial conditions, um, phi k, and I'll say we have n phi at different initial conditions. OK, so let's see some examples. OK, so this is just some numerical examples when bit, so our detailed model, our sort of truth, is that we have 10 species, we reduce down to four. And we have three initial conditions. So we take data. The data here is shown in the red triangles. We start with the reduced model, which is the orange dotted line. And then we calibrate this embedded operator and recover the dynamics that are in the blue, um, the blue curves. So that's showing the median response and the 50% and 95% uh, confidence intervals. OK, so that's fine. This is fairly typical of results you'll see for um, calibration. Now we can ask, what about um, how well do these enriched models work for scenarios that, um, that the models haven't seen yet? I mean, in the sense that for in, um, uh, scenarios for which they have not been calibrated. And so this plot is showing that. So this is an example of some validation scenarios. Um, again, starting with um, s equals 10. I mean, this is the same example, little s equals 4. So it's been calibrated on three other scenarios. And you can see that you know, this model has not seen these initial conditions before. And it's still doing quite a good job in recovering the correct dynamics. OK, well, there's a ton of different models and initial conditions and interaction coefficients that we could look at. So I'll try to, um, and we don't want to just eyeball everything <laughs> one by one. So we'll try to kind of quantify uh, this calibration and validation a bit better. So to do that, I'll use something I call the gamma value. And so what is it? Well, it's just a rigorous comparison between the model output that we have and an observation. So if you imagine our model output is this blue um, curve, it's a, a PDF because um, the, well, because we use a probabilistic, the Bayesian probability to calibrate these parameters. And so we get a, a PDF of our model output. And the red line is our observation. Then the gamma value corresponds to the shaded area here. So it collects all of the area <laughs> of this PDF that or under the PDF that is less likely than the observation that we have, given that we believe this model. OK, so if we have a high gamma value, then that uh, indicates that there is consistency between the model output and the observation. If we have a very low gamma value, then that indicates that the model and the data are, in fact, inconsistent. So we want, um, you know, we, we might still get some low gamma values, but um, in general, if our model and our output, if our model and our data are consistent, then we should have more um, gamma values that are not very small. OK, so now this is just for one data point. For any given detailed and reduced model pair, we can sample a bunch of different random matrices to make up a, a detailed and a reduced model. And then you know, we can compute all of these gamma values for every different data point. And that's what I've done. And so this is. Um, there's a lot going on in this plot. So this is um, a plot showing gamma values when our detailed model has 10 species, 
along the x-axis, we have little s. So these are the, that corresponds to the number of species included in the reduced model. And then this f sub gamma on the y-axis is the fraction of gamma values that are below a given threshold, in this case, 0 0.05. Um, these other numbers, this 10 is, again, means that we start with 10 species in the reduced model. Little s is on the x-axis. P um, corresponds to whether or not the data is the type of data, whether it's calibration or validation data. 100 means this is sampled over 100 different um, random matrices, so 100 different detailed and reduced model pairs. And so you can see here that the number of gamma values above the threshold starts out higher, and as we include more and more species into our reduced model, then this um, the number of small gamma values decreases. Um, of course, valid, the validation points are lagging a bit behind the calibration points, but also still um, decreasing. Um, this is the same plot now, but for um, big S equals 20. This is slightly more interesting. We have this kind of hump in the middle. Um, I have some hunches why that might be happening, um, but I'm but nothing proven. So if you want to talk more about that, please contact me um, at your convenience. Um, okay, but still you can see that, that these models are um, not uh, doing that badly <laughs> in the sense that, you know, if this were the actual true model, then we would expect that this fraction should be around 0. Uh, zero 0.05. And so um, the fact that even our validation data is approaching that um, is encouraging. Okay, there's a lot of questions that still remain in this work. Um, one thing that is very interesting is to ask, is there some intrinsic or effective dimension to the model error? Um, what is it? How can we model it? What variables should it really depend on? Uh, how does it depend on the number of species that are included between the reduced and the detailed models? Um, of course, we had some pretty strict uh, assumptions about this interaction matrix A. So what happens when those are relaxed and related to that? Could this type of work, um, could this work for oscillatory or chaotic systems? Um, and just if you're interested in this, here's some more information. There's um, a preprint of this work available in the archive. Um, there's a, I've worked on a related uh, type of representation of model error um, in combustion models, and that's in the um, SIAM JUQ. Um, also more recently, I worked um, on an application to these um, SEIR type epidemiology models, and that showed up this year in chaos. And yeah, if you have any questions or would like to discuss further or have a nice application problem that you want to try this on, I would love to talk more. And please just send me an email. Um, I'm Rebecca M at colorado.edu, and I would love to talk more with any of you about it. So thanks very much.